It was a very difficult time in my life. Uh, I had decided that I didn't want to live anymore, so I decided to take my own life. Um, what really led up to the point of that was really uh, many, many years of despair, uh, essentially self-despair. Uh, I really didn't see uh, the people in the help that was available around me. Um, I didn't really want to see it. I was kind of uh, stuck in my own little world, uh, stuck in my own little vision, essentially. And uh, yeah, eventually came to that decision that uh, I just wasn't interested in life anymore. Um, I had taken a good handful of pills uh, and um, yeah, as far as I was concerned, these pills were going to do the job. So I was not... Uh, I was not expecting to come back. I was not expecting to continue to live or anything like that. It's something I've also seen um, in un other conversations I've had with people about this experience. Um, sometimes they can be quite mean about it and say, oh, well, you didn't finish the job. Well, for me, I did, actually. Yeah, so I was at that point. Uh yeah, and as I said, I, I just didn't see any of the people around me. I had family that loved me. Um, I wasn't interested in that. Um, as far as I could tell, the world wasn't really there. I was, I guess, singular to me, alone, and I didn't see anything other than that. <laughs> and yeah, so I took all the pills. Um, it was about, I think, 56 pills or something like that. Don't quote me on the number. And sat there alone in my apartment and pretty much just waited for death. But there were a few other things that I had done. Um, the last thing I did was I laid on my sofa uh, to watch TV. I thought, okay, I can just watch TV while I'm waiting for death. And uh, there was a sitcom on there with Santa Claus on it, which for some reason made me smile. But uh, as I fell asleep, that's the last thing I remember. Uh, yeah, sometime after that, I really don't know what time was after that. Uh, I couldn't... I couldn't comprehend time or anything like that. I started having hallucinations from the pills. Uh, instead of actually killing me, I woke up. <laughs> and uh, I remember everything is very foggy at this point. Everything is very chopped up, like time was really stop and go. And I only remember small portions of the hallucinations. Um, like I remember thinking that I was giving a child a bath in my bathtub, but what was actually happening was, I found out later, of course, what was actually happening was there was a bathroom rug <laughs> in the, in the uh, tub, and I had filled it up with water, and it overflowed because I, of course, was out of my mind at this point. The water went downstairs in the apartment downstairs below me, and she, the tenant down there, had called the police. Well, she wanted to know why there was water coming down the walls. <laughs> and the police came, apparently. I do remember having some conversations with the police. They were asking me, are you on Mars? What's up? What are you doing? And, uh, you know, this, this was kind of a tough area um, around Chicago, so drugs and, and stuff were pretty much a daily routine there. Uh, so for the cops, I wasn't really harmful to myself or anything. I didn't, I don't remember telling them that I had uh, attempted to take my own life. And yeah, so they just left basically um, after checking out the apartment and stuff like that. They left and that's when I think most of the other stuff happened. <laughs> so again, I remember sitting on my sofa, I sat down and uh, just sort of thought, okay, well, that didn't work. Now what? Um, that was one thought I remember remembering. And then everything became all of a sudden extremely clear. Uh, around me, it was still like these hallucinogenic feelings. 
but I had sort of a tunnel vision, sort of a, a well, um, not a tunnel vision, that's the wrong word, because I didn't see a tunnel, but um, I had a, an extreme focus of one point, um, and I had sort of looked up to the left corner of my room, and I saw a little black dot up there, and I thought, okay, what is that? That's weird. I don't remember seeing that. <laughs> And as I said, this this was all ultra real at this point. The black dot had started becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, and it came towards me. And started I started to see details and started to realize what it was. Uh, I had seen lots of black, and it sort of looked like a sort of looked like a Halloween cloak, I guess, or a cloak, you know, like robes, basically. Um, there was little movement to it, but this uh, black was also so black, I, you, you couldn't really see it. It was so black. It just sort of sucked in everything around it, <laughs> um, it seemed like. And then I started seeing a face as it came nearer and nearer, or at least a head, sort of, and hands. And the thing about this was the head was elongated and thin, and the hands were very long and, and I could say, bony. Um, and for lack of better words, it looked sort of like a Grim Reaper. Uh, yeah, and what was kind of interesting to me was, first of all, I wasn't scared, not at all. Uh, I had zero fear. I felt like an old friend was coming to visit. Um, I just sort of felt like, oh, okay, oh, hi. Well, that's interesting. There you are. Hi. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, it is slightly disturbing, the image, because um, the skin, if you could call it skin, was sort of like cracked ash, like um, like as if you were to see mud uh, that's dried up, that's heavily dried up with cracks in it, very deep cracks, except it was ash and not mud. Uh, it looked like the color of ash, basically. I didn't see any floating things or anything, so... Yeah, this thing continued to come down to me and uh, sat actually in the chair <laughs> across from me. And we had a conversation. The thing is, though, uh, I'll just say the Grim Reaper, for lack of better words, uh, didn't have really much of a mouth. There was more of a slit there where a mouth would be, and that didn't move. Nothing really moved on the Grim Reaper except for the robes moved slightly. And when we talked, it was telepathic. It was just a two-way connection, basically. We thought, and those were the words, and the feelings sort of followed that. Honestly, I don't remember what we talked about, unfortunately. I would imagine, I can only imagine what we talked about, so I won't try to, I won't try to put too much into that. <laughs> but at some point, the Grim Reaper just sort of pointed at me, stuck its finger, like, right in the direction of my face, and I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. And in the next second, it was sort of like in the blink of an eye, uh, I was somewhere else without the Grim Reaper anymore. <laughs> That was gone. And uh, like I said, through this entire experience, I had uh, no fear at all. I didn't even really question what was going on. It just happened. And I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> this is the next step uh, or whatever. And, you know, for me to have the following experience at that time is very difficult. And I need to explain a little bit to you where I was before this all happened, I guess, a little bit deeper. Um, I was also in a very hateful point in my life. Um, I pretty much despised all of humanity as much as myself and uh, any life on this planet. As far as I was concerned, uh, if an atom bomb exploded, I would have been happy. Um, that was where I was back then. Why were you in that state of mind? You know, I ask myself that often, uh, and through the years, it's taken me a while to kind of figure that out. Um, mostly, I can just say that I had seen things that I found I didn't like, uh, especially about the way people treated other people. Uh, the way people treated me. Uh, I grew up, like I said, in a fairly tough area. Um, I was also picked on ex uh, 
a lot as a child and I didn't know how to deal with that. So I think this was, yeah, I, I mean, I was obviously not psychologically stark. Uh, so, I'm sorry. I was, I speak German as well. <laughs> um, I was obviously not psychologically strong and, um, yeah, that was my way of dealing with it, I guess, was to take that anger and hate and pain that I had and push it out on the world because it's better than than chewing on it myself, I guess, you know. And that's what I did. But uh, that did, I guess, lead to my self-destruction. Uh, yeah, so that's that's where my mind was at that point. So for me to have this experience, what I'm about to talk about is is for me nearly impossible at that point. I would have expected something else. What religion says is, of course, something completely different. Uh, yeah, so I was all of a sudden in this place that was just bright light. Um, I, like I said, I didn't see a tunnel or anything like that. It was just an instantaneous... I, I blinked my eyes and I was there. And this bright light was <clears throat> not just a light like... Uh, not just a normal light, like, for instance, what's behind me. <laughs> um, this light was enveloping, like I was in it, I was it. Uh, I was a part of it. And aside from that, there was this uh, strong feeling of, of love. And you hear this a lot, and it is very difficult to put into words because I don't think that there's really any human words we can use to describe that amount of love the, the best i've come up with over the years it's 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 comparable to the love you have for your child the love you have uh for siblings maybe the love you have for your mother or your father or or your aunt or your uncle or family or anything it's it's that but it's more than just that feeling it's that's what's it's what's behind it that's there and it's magnified to the point of something you can't believe um and you are just in that you're a part of it you feel it you are that experience uh and that's what i was and it was very interesting to me uh afterwards as i started remembering that at that point in my life i would have that sort of a feeling um that's what really set this entire thing in reality for me um it, that would be impossible for me back then yeah so going on um there was somebody standing next to me at some point. I noticed it. I didn't move my head or anything. I could actually see all around me the entire time as if I didn't have eyes and my eyes were just everywhere. <laughs> um, it's one of the reasons why I kind of thought, okay, well, apparently I'm not in my body. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> And this person beside me, I didn't see the face. The face was blurred out, um, but I had the feeling that it was somebody who also cared for me, and I also had the feeling that this person was uh, essentially smiling. I had feelings of that from him, so, uh, from them. I don't know if it was a him. Um, yeah, but I could see the hair, and for me... I mean, I'm not a particularly religious person, but uh, for me, I saw so long flowing brown hair as if uh, the pictures of Jesus and all that that you would see. Um, I also kind of noticed the clothing he was wearing. It was uh, just sort of a white robe, sort of like the Grim Reaper, just in white and light. Um, but there was a definition to it, so that was kind of interesting. So we also had a conversation, and again, it was without moving mouths. I mean, I don't even know if I had a mouth at that point. <laughs> it was just a telepathic movement, basically, between us. Um, and the, the mode and the feeling of everything also went with the conversation. Um, but all of this am still in the environment of complete and total absorbing love. And... We did that for some time, and at some point, uh, in the blink of an eye, again, we were in another place. Uh, this time we were in, I don't know if I could call it a city, it sort of felt like a city. Uh, I could sort of see what I would say structures or buildings behind where we were, or in front of where we were, I guess, from our perspective. Um, 
they kind of had sort of a mountainous feel to them. They weren't really like uh, huge buildings like we would know, but that was not the focus of what I saw at that point, so I didn't pay much attention to them. Uh, I did see in front of me and below me sort of a bubble, um, and this bubble had a bunch of swirling colors in it, as if you uh, a child would blow bubbles in the sunlight, and you see all the colors of the light in the bubble. That was basically what it was like, but it was huge. It was person-sized, and uh, it was also swirling with these colors that I had never experienced before, at least in my human recollection. And as I looked closer and closer, this took a small amount of time for me to actually pay attention to what was inside the bubble. Uh, for some reason, I was more interested in the person next to me. <laughs> but I think that they were trying to get me to pay attention to the bubble. So I looked into the bubble, and I saw a person. And I paid more attention to the face, and it was me. I saw myself laying in this bubble. Uh, it was also sort of like a fetal position. Um, which to me these days, uh, I've read a little bit more into that and thought about it a lot. And I really think that this experience was to show me that I was being healed or I was being, um, washed somehow or protected. Um, and I think that really was me basically, uh, wherever we are at this point. <laughs> and so I was... Anyways, getting along, I was looking at myself in this bubble thinking, that's interesting. Okay, that's me, but I'm me. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I also realized that there was somebody standing behind us, you know. And I continued having a conversation with the person next to me. And at some point, it sort of started coming into my thoughts, that person behind us, that's also me. So... I'm standing there watching me have a conversation with a person looking at me in a human-sized bubble. <laughs> it was a very interesting and strange experience when I think about it. So, yeah, uh, there really wasn't too much more there. There isn't too much more that I remember about that. Um, the next instant, uh, basically, that I remember, uh, I was with my person still, and I, I like to say to this day that I think that was probably my guide or something like that, or somebody that cares about me a lot, uh, that came to me and tried to help me, I think. And uh, yeah, we were together again, this time we were flying. And we were flying with our arms stretched out, sort of like you play airplane as kids. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I've thought about that experience as well a lot and wondered, why do I remember that? Why is that important to this experience? Well, it is because you have to remember that the place I was in as a human being at that point was very dark and deep and singular. Um, and this reminder, hey, there's fun stuff in life, too. It could just be putting your arms out and acting like you're an airplane. I think that's what that was. Um interjecting on that from today <laughs> but uh, yeah so we flew around basically and flew straight ahead and uh, just had a bunch of fun basically and I remember feeling that I was looking towards this person next to me and still feeling like this this smile and this laughter on the face not still not seeing it but feeling it and anyways I remember looking down and seeing like a field big green pasture kind of field. There was really nothing there particularly until a while. Basically, we, we flow, flew over a field for a while until I finally saw something. Um, to my left again, for some reason, my entire experience has to do a lot with the left. <laughs> so uh, to my left again, I saw a forest, um, a very thick forest, beautiful trees. And, uh, you know, Sabrina, it was... Um, kind of interesting to me. I could smell and feel the forest and the trees and the field uh, like on a warm summer morning after it's rained. Uh, you have this like clean, um, clean water, warmth feeling and smell. The humidity in the air and stuff carries all that. And uh, it's very comforting to us as human beings. And that's uh, what I also noticed from all of this. But you know, it wasn't just that I smelled it and felt it. It was in me. It was a part of me. Um, but I was also myself. <laughs>
So, yeah, we flew over this field with the forest to the left for a little while, and then at some point I started seeing an opening, like a clearing. And I looked down in the clearing, and it caught my interest, and all of a sudden I was down there in the opening together with a bunch of people. (laughs) And uh, this was a group of people in, like, medieval-style clothing, um, like old clothing, it's... Yeah, I mean, the the whole medieval thing is interesting for me anyways. I think that's pretty obvious. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we they were dancing and basically partying and having a lot of fun. And I, of course, tried to join in as much as I could. And uh, there were also animals here, which was kind of interesting to me. I remember seeing uh, animals running around and jumping up and down like uh, dogs. Specifically, I remember um, who the dogs belonged to. I have no idea, but they were there. (laughs) And yeah, so, and again, I, I really think that all of this was for me when I think about it now, was for me to tell me, hey, there are fun things in life. You don't have to be where you are. That's what I think that was all about. Uh, Yeah, so then in the next instant, uh, by the way, this was slightly dark, sort of like dusk. Um, The light was still enveloping me, but it had a, a darkness to it. Not a scary kind of darkness or anything like that, just as if the sun was going down. <laughs> and... Uh, I remember flying again with my my friend for a very short time, and then all of a sudden my friend was gone, and I was completely alone. Uh, but I was flying, and I was continued, continuing to fly. I remember looking forward and seeing a horizon. I hadn't seen that anywhere else in my experience. I had seen just an unending light and love, basically, but now I was seeing a horizon. Uh, This horizon was also kind of a blue-gray light, and uh, it sort of mixed with the green of the grass. I remember going faster and faster and faster towards the horizon until I woke up on my couch. (laughs) Yeah. So that's full circle. That's that's it. (laughs) I was right back where I started. Uh, that's so interesting and there's so many fascinating things um, that happened within your experience. I was wondering in the conversations that you've had with the Grim Reaper and the other entity, the light entity, mm-hmm. um, I know that you said you can't remember what was said, but do you sort of have an idea of what was being discussed or if you received any messages or if you said anything about what was, you know, hurting you at the time? Unfortunately, I really don't. And uh, I have thought about this ever since the experience. Uh, This experience happened to me over 20 years ago. We'll just say that. Um, And I, I really don't have anything from it. And to say that I had anything from it would be lying, and I don't really care for that. <laughs> um, no, that is fair enough, because I think a lot of times people will not forget, but will not get some of those conversations when they come back, uh, because they were meant to understand it and hear it in that moment, but not when they come back. Um, but that's yeah. what I was curious, because... Basically, you had this experience, but you were back, you know, on your couch with the same external circumstances that led you to that point, right? So what do you make of it? You had this suicide attempt. It failed. What's next? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I really do think that the entire experience had to do with... Uh, healing that state that I was in, basically showing me uh, how to deal with that kind of thing. I think uh, I'm just I'm just going to say a little bit of what I think right now. Um, I think that we come to this planet. I think that we come to this life. Uh, a lot of people say it as well uh, that have had these experiences that we are here to do something for ourselves and for the entirety of humanity basically or the entirety of life itself um and 
I think that we are also imperfect, of course, uh, and that's a part of this experience. I think that for me, uh, I had possibly chosen to be a little bit more cynical than I, than I can handle, uh, honestly. And I, I think that became too much for me in my spirit. Uh, and <clears throat> I really think that this experience had a lot to do with that. It was taking the part of me that is really me, uh, bringing it into the environment that we're already in and reminding me, hey, you are not just this experience right now. You are not just the human experience. You can also look around. You can also have fun. You can also do other things. You don't have to concentrate on on uh, how horrible uh, how horrible people can be to another. Um, I think that's a lot of what it was. It was a healing experience for me. Yeah. I, I believe that. And you also mentioned in telling you about your experience, you mentioned you know, the fun side of life quite a few mm. times. So that leads me to believe that up to then you weren't very open to having fun or it wasn't seen as something that had purpose. You know, you had other things to do. It was, it was something, yeah, that's not completely true. I mean, uh, I really liked to ride uh, roller coasters and stuff like that. I mean, I had fun. Uh, I also, as far as I'm concerned, I liked to party a lot back then and stuff like that. And for me, that was fun. And uh, yeah, I just, I didn't see that. I didn't pay attention to that where I was. It's, it's like I said, this, this mind frame that I was in was just... Uh, it was only concentrating on everything that goes wrong, only concentrating on everything that I don't like or that people don't like. It's very, yeah, muddy, I guess. It's like going through tar. How did, that, how did your life change from that point? So it sounds like your mindset was different after mm -hmm. that experience. So how but you still had the same life as before right so then how do you start to change that to something that you would enjoy being a part of that is also a very interesting question because it didn't change for me immediately um my answer is probably going to surprise you a little bit 